Nedir? My response is, is both a mix of what you, what you just said and what I've been reading. So speaking to those some of the more about some some what's what closer? Ooh. <laughs> Because I was thinking of what to say, I wanted to start with the opening. Uh, before I start, I'd like to say something, which I think is such a funny opening because it reminds me that we have these multiple eyes. And I feel like I have two, at least two eyes in response to listening to you. And I wanted to represent them. One of them uh, really strongly resonates as an int intellectual history background and appreciates the journey through Kant and, and Habermas and Foucault and seeing myself as a real product of that lineage and appreciating that peace is a moral discourse and learning how to um, appreciate difference in a, in a, in a different way. Um, and that intervention is, is problematic for all the reasons that you've described to us. And while I'm doing this and I'm with you, <laughs> I have this other eye that keeps speaking up and saying, uh, if there were, if I were faced with a with a genocide, and I felt like I had some material way to intervene, that I would hope that I would do something to stop the killing, knowing that you might call me a hegemon, <laughs> and taking hope, hoping in a way that I would still take that risk, and my, you know, almost in a way that I would, <laughs> I was thinking I would throw myself on a in front of a tractor that was about to kill the last panda habitat, you know. If even if I spent the rest of my days trying to change our discourse around how we relate to the planet and its, and its creatures. So I wanted to ask you about if there's a place in your theory for any kind of stopping of an intervention that's not hegemonic, or am I just going to be left with that uh, uncomfortable difference <laughs> um, within myself of, of um, having to play those two, um, or the terrible choice, I guess, and hoping that I'm never faced with that terrible choice. Okay, this is um, this is both. Can you hear me out there? Okay, um, this is both your question and a question I got when I was uh, being picked up from my hotel by Patrick over there. <laughs> uh, Patrick's been very hospitable. He's also given me a bit of a hard time, you know, and that hard time. Uh, you know, for good reason, comes from the fact that, um, for those of you who don't know Patrick, uh, he hails from Rwanda. And the response to the Rwandan genocide was actually a kind of politics of indifference when it was happening. Because to have labeled what was going on in Rwanda as a genocide would have invited uh, some sort of intervention. Right. So, um, so under what conditions, you're asking, would I, let's say, sanction uh, intervention? Now, it's very interesting that uh, every intervention that's taken place, purportedly in the name of human rights, has in a sense responded to the crisis situation. But if you look at the archives of the conflicts that we have intervened in, for example, in the Balkans, if you look at those archives, actually the crisis situations were happening much before our interventions came about. Much before. In Kosovo, not just the uh, incarceration of the whole population, right? In, in that region, by the Milosevic regime, but also the active expulsion of the Kosovars from every institution of society, including universities. Now, why weren't there interventions then? There were calls for intervention, but not of the military kind. There were calls to uh, empower the Kosovan political uh, representatives who were there, right? 
um, to provide, for example, financing for universities and grants and, and so on and so forth. Why don't we intervene then? Why do we assume that the crisis situation is that which we determine is the crisis situation? In relation to Rwanda especially, my response to Patrick was, when, when he was asking, well, what do you do when there's a genocide going on? We knew that that genocide would go on. There were a number of signals that could have been read that suggested that one side was targeting the, the other exactly in those racialized terms. In other words, terms that rendered the other expendable. So, uh, secondly, intervention would have meant once again the direct targeting of the po very populations that were being subject to violence. Those who advocate intervention suggest that violence might be responded to with even more violence. because populations are expendable. But only certain populations are seen to be expendable. And we have to look at that. Why is it that we so readily resort to military forms of intervention? So I can't see that I would actually ever advocate a police, a global kind of policing process that undermines the potentials of the post-colonial society evolving into a political society, a society wherein politics can happen. Now, there's much by way of, uh, if you like, the corruption of what a sovereign state should do. A sovereign state is about providing for the welfare of its population. Within the European context, the European Union was formed and imagined exactly on the basis that of the state as having responsibility for the provision of welfare. What is the European Union? The European Union is about the welfare state, but now supranationally organized. That's the secular state. That's what the state should be about. Um, but it's not about, in a sense, manifesting that state through violence. That never works. In my view, it does not work because you're inevitably targeting the very populations who are subject to violence, who are indeed the victims of violence. This is why the Syrian opposition, the nonviolent opposition, is absolutely against intervention. The Afghan women's movement is against the presence of our troops in that country. There are feminist movements that existed clandestinely, secretly, argued against intervention even when that intervention at the very beginnings when the collapse of the Taliban regime was an inevitability, and that's how they understood it. Now, despite the daily dangers, the daily crises that the women of that country experienced, they were still against intervention because they knew the consequences to their own population and their own societies of intervention. So that's my, that's my answer. Um. First, thank you for coming. It was a pleasure hearing you talk, and I was especially excited at, you know, meeting a fellow lover of Foucault. Um, going off that, uh, one of the things you started, you talked under Foucault, w and you asked uh, was, where are the boundaries? Who is on the outside, and who decides when we have this international level? And I thought your example that you gave of kind of the sovereign power showing their power within a square by ordering someone to be quartered and ordering it to be visible was very interesting, but kind of the rest, the the thing that he goes into the book is that this becomes, as opposed to um, an imposition of violence and law on the body, it eventually becomes one internally in our current prison system and 
you know, how it becomes one of kind of imposing on the body. It becomes one of uh, imposing on your mind and your spirit and your thinking. And he talks a little bit about this also in all of his writings on madness, about how madness is very relative. It's of why you're not, how or why you're not agreeing with the sovereign power. And obviously, I love Foucault, but th one of the biggest critiques of him is he's very liberal le leaning and he's, he's, a, he's a patriarchal philosopher. And that really got me to thinking about whether there is a place for in an international arena, whether it's the UN or whether it's ICC, there is a place for pluralism, especially in human rights where human rights are very, the way we define them now, are very Western, are very um, liberal leaning. And uh, I know in your discourses on violence, you mentioned that actors have a role where they can change the structure of you know where they are. So I wanted to see if you thought there was a place where plural, um, where different ideas of human rights and different ideas of kind of how places should be governed and how people should be allowed to represent themselves, if there's a place for that in our current system, and if there has ever is a system that can represent the pluralism of societies. There is all sorts of talk, and this includes Jürgen Habermas, by the way. Um, there's all sorts of talk about ecumenical dialogue, both religious and, I mean, the word ecumenical is, is a religious word. Um, but the idea of dialogue across difference. Huh? Um, Habermas writes about uh, the legitimization of cosmopolitan law through dialogue, so that you legitimize what, is, what has been put in place by engaging with difference. And this is his response to his critics. Huh? Um, but is that really pluralism, or is it the actually the celebration of one particular culture, namely namely liberalism? So it's the triumph of, you know, the tri the triumph of liberalism. Now, you said that Michel Foucault is, is a patriarch. He calls it an. Uh, I think he'd be probably turning in his grave if, uh, um, if, 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 he, if he heard you, you know. Um, you said he's a patriarch and he's a liberal. That's an interesting idea, and it comes up in relation to his response to the Iranian revolution. I'll tell you a bit about that, because it, it's interesting. It, it shows the dilemmas, the dilemmas that, that in a sense, we're faced with, especially those of us who are, um, you know, on the, on the side of, uh, let us say, an emancipatory form of politics. Um, Michel Foucault observes the Iranian revolution as it's taking place. Now, for some of you, this is going way back in history, the, the young, uh, young students here. Um, when the Iranian revolution was happening, one of my best friends is Iranian. My goddaughter is, is, is indeed Iranian, British Iranian. When the revolution was happening, it was a bit like observing Tahrir Square. Because when it started, it was not an Islamic revolution. The Iranian revolution became an Islamic revolution. It did not start that way. Huh? Um, so Michel Foucault is observing this, and then it becomes an Islamic revolution and the mullahs take over. And he thinks this is an interesting manifestation of resistance, as he put it, against an imposed modernization. To Michel Foucault, this was the emer emergence, as he put it, of the hermeneutic self. In other words, the self who can, who has her or his own interpretative capacity. In other words, that the Iranian revolution for Michel Foucault had moved towards some sort of a spiritual understanding of that society, of self. This is where Jabri disagrees with Michel Foucault. Foucault was not an expert on the Middle East. 
he enacted in that very statement was what Edward Said would call an Orientalism, the exoticization of the other. So when people talk about the possibility of a pluralist understanding of, let, let us say, international law or even cosmopolitan law, somehow I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not convinced uh, at all by that. Actually, I have a, a nostalgia for the ethos of the anti-colonial struggle. You could think of this nation, America, and its founding fathers as actually constituting that anti-colonial struggle and the creation of political community out of that struggle. If you suggest, or if we suggest, that we might design a cosmopolitan law that trumps bounded, limited political communities, then, in a sense, one effect, and very serious effect, is to distance the citizen from her or his own political community. There is no way in which local politicians can ever have legitimacy with their local population. I'm not arguing for some sort of mad right-wing reactionary communitarian politics. I'm as cosmopolitan as they come, right? But the sort of cosmopolitanism that I want to advocate is a cosmopolitanism of solidarity, where choices, as I was saying earlier, where choices are made. We're faced with the dilemma, what do, do we have the right to even uh, make any judgment about, for example, the um, outcome of the Egyptian of the Egyptian elections, but we have to make those choices. You know, as a woman and as a feminist, I would be pretending, I would be hypocritical to say that I celebrate the outcome of the Egyptian revolution, or I should say, the Egyptian election, because there's a difference, by the way, between the outcome of that election. And the spirit of those revolutionaries who were on the ground in Tahrir Square, you know, as a feminist and as a woman, I would simply be lying if I said, well, this is all right in the name of pluralism. I have a problem with that. Uh, so, um, let me say two things, uh, Vivian. One, uh, I think it's... Uh, for me, at least, this is a, a historic uh, Lynch lecture because I think that you're raising some questions that are crucial to the development of our field and that have been um, assiduously avoided here by much of the field. Um, the possibility that there might be a conflict between conflict resolution and peace building, <coughs> for example. Peace building is the the buzzword of the present, it's the kind of, it's the popular movement, in, especially in Washington, D.C. Um, and by, by, by raising the possibility of conflict between those two concepts, I think that you do us a major service. Uh, to illustrate, uh, I've been recently uh, attending um, uh, peace building meetings called by the Association for Peace Building and uh, hearing them talk, uh, for example, about peace-building activities in Syria, uh, which involve trying to resolve conflicts between members of the Syrian opposition. Uh, that's what's being called peace-building. And one, when raises the question, isn't conflict resolution, shouldn't conflict resolution pay some attention between trying to resolve conflicts between parties in what is a civil war, not simply a revolt of uh, the masses uh, against a handful of, uh, of regime toadies, um, I, uh, that the response is, what are you talking about? Human rights, et cetera, um, are what you're calling the, uh, the cosmopolitan imaginary demands uh, 
solidarity with the opposition. Uh, well, speaking of people turning over in their graves, I can see John Burton turning over in his grave as soon as, that, as, soon as that's said. Uh, since a civil war is a civil war, there are two parties to it. Conflict resolutionists appear to have thrown in the towel, saying we can't, uh, especially in the U.S. and in Washington, D.C., we can't even consider sitting at a table with the uh, Assad regime. So therefore, what do we do? We try to resolve conflicts between members of the opposition and call it peace building, which is in fact taking sides in, uh, uh, in an imperial enterprise. Um, that sort of thing, which is now happening with great regularity as what might be even called a government, U.S. government takeover of our, prof our profession, um, proceeds bit by bit, um, is hasn't really risen to the level of consciousness be in part because it hasn't been theorized by people like you and in part because so many people have jobs and, mo and grant monies and uh, are dependent on uh, the government that they seem perfectly happy to turn our profession into an adjunct uh, of U.S. foreign policy. So that's, this is a problem for us and I must say that in the meeting called by the peace building folks, at U.S. Institute of Peace, Fratragorian, uh, a USIP, former USIP official, recognized this, saying that all this talk of coordination and the seamless integration of our profession into, um, into U.S. foreign policy, corporate foreign policy, international organization foreign policy, wasn't ex really what we had in mind. Yeah. But the question that I so I really thank you for raising these issues, which I think are of critical importance, and giving them a very interesting theoretical background. And I, but I have to say also that I'm wondering where what we do about it. And I'm wondering, especially since Marx doesn't list doesn't uh, get appear in your list of of theorists. Um, I'm wondering the extent to which the, the mater there's a mater material drive underlying this current cosmopolitanism and that what you refer to as liberalism could also be referred to as late capitalism and not. Can we make a difference without surfacing that uh, reality and confronting the, s the global socioeconomic structure? I mean, we can't, clearly, we can't do everything, but my only reservation about that, what I thought was a wonderful presentation was that it operated on the level of, so much on the level of ideas that one might not suspect that there were also people making money on the basis of, of, this, uh, of these ideas. Well, thank you for that, Richard. Um, actually, as it happens at the weekend, uh, we had a conference at the LSE on materiality and international relations. And that's what you're calling for. You're, you're saying that we need a materialist understanding of this. Now, um, I was already worried that my talk might be a bit too uh, theoretical and somehow celebrating of uh, particular personalities in in philosophy. So Marx would not get a mention. <laughs> um, but what we're talking about in relation to peace building is actually the, um, the triumph of neoliberalism as, as peace building. We want to build societies that are am amenable to a neoliberal order. Um, much of the practices that we've seen in the recent past, and you don't need me to remind you what's been going on in, in, in these various interventions. For example, the rise of the private security firm. Peace building actually relies a great deal on, on these firms. Um, Peace building does not talk about the transformation of global structures that continue to impoverish the vast majority of the global population. Peace building does not do that. 
if anything, it perpetuates this, uh, it perpetuates those divisions. Because the societies that peace building seeks to reshape and redesign, um, in a sense, invite, um, that's the wrong word to use, and now it's about 3 a.m. or f even 4 a.m. <laughs> in, in my time. It's the wrong word to use. Um, uh, you know, the, the economic imperatives that are there and that are, that are sustaining and perpetuating the, um, uh, the practices of, 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 of peace building have to be recognized in, in the, you know, in, in the analysis. And I, w I would agree with you that um, I've mentioned several specters today. The specter of Marx absolutely hovers, uh, hovers over this. And I, I've written on uh, the significance of, of Marxism in, in relation to uh, critical thought and indeed a any emancipatory uh, idea of what it is to be modern capitalists and, and the constraints on, on, on modernity. So... Um, so I would very much agree with you that there's a there's a need for a for a materialist understanding. Now, having said that, that materialist understanding <coughs> comes in both in terms of the materiality of warfare that goes on and the innovations in technologies of warfare that uh, feed into the various interventions that we've seen. So more latterly, in relation to the use of drone technology, for example, as an intervention, so that it's not us who are in danger, but rather uh, populations of others. Um, so materiality comes in through the technologies of warfare. However, it also comes in in the motivations for certain interventions, especially the intervention in Iraq was about the dispossession of, of, of in my opinion, of, of that that country. And um, people like um, David Harvey, for example, would, would approach the subject very much from a, from a Marxist perspective. If I could inter intervene just for a minute. Um, Alex, we would like you to ask the last question here, and then we're going to set up a mic over here. Um, because the hand ones don't work very well. We can't hear you unless it's right in your face. So yeah. we'll ask people if they've got a couple questions to stand up here, and, and then we're going to wrap it up probably in 15 minutes. So, um, so Alex, let me turn this to you, and then if people want to uh, line up for some questions, you can come right here. Thank you. Okay. Well, ma'am, first, I appreciate you being here. And uh, I am the, the undergrad. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. And uh, as the undergrad, I've just, I've just been introduced to uh, this series, and, and, I, and I do appreciate what it says. And especially, oh, can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay. That uh, war itself is an accepted discourse, that it's, the, the violence, you know, is just accepted as necessary. They, and uh, I guess my question pertains to just, reiterating that I may have an understanding of what you're saying. And what you said when you're talking uh, is that, uh, excuse me, hold on a second. The ideas of, of sovereignty, yeah. and one of them is, you know, the decision of who lives and who dies. Now, items like responsibility to protect, things like this, is it, the way we wait for to intervene in crisis when it's in absolute crisis mode like a genocide would it still be representative of the ones that we choose because there's many conflicts that we leave we decide not to intervene like that would it still be possible to understand that as a public execution that she talks about the way we choose to do this we make it very symbolic of who we choose and who we pursue I thought I might be a bit too controversial to um, bring up that subject, actually. 
um, being where I am, you know, visiting your country. And I, I absolutely love coming to the US. Um, and every time I come, there's a wonderful hospitality. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very much an admirer of um, the many achievements of, of the US, really. And, um, you know, un understand Hannah Arendt when she talks about the American Revolution. Um, I can... I know you can tell that I'm coming up with a however. <laughs> and the public execution. Um, as Sandy mentioned earlier, I have written about shock and awe. Um, in an article in the journal Millennium, this Journal of International Studies, um, Shock and awe, I've argued there, is the equivalent of the public execution. If you read the people who actually designed the strategy as a military strategy, uh, you will be convinced by what, what I'm about to say. Shock and awe was and is designed to use such force, such overwhelming force, that you would convince the other guy to give in, to surrender. Now, shock and awe could be implemented against the armed forces of the enemy. But shock and awe manifest in our time, in our late modernity, was directed at a metropolitan city, a heavily populated city. And what that manifests is sovereign power writ large a sovereign power that manifests itself globally. And what does it do, therefore, to the rest of us watching? Because the whole world was watching. We were all watching. We were all witnesses to that. And so the images that came out of shock and awe made their imprint on our... Uh, on our sensibilities and our uh, perceptions of what was going on. So we were all an audience to that particular globally manifest public execution. Um, unfortunately, it was the civilians of Baghdad who got it most badly. Um, we were all witnesses, so what was happening to us as subjects witnessing? Sovereign power is about not just the performance of sovereignty, the performance of that power. It's also about the disciplining and the government of those who watch. This is what I can do. As Slavoj Žižek argues, uh, a contemporary political theorist who hails from Slovenia, and works mostly actually in London now, and is, uh, you know, some of you might think I'm mad, but <laughs> you watch Slavoj Žižek talking, and he, you know, if I were imitating him, I'd be going like this all the time. Um, and the references that he makes to culture and to philosophy and history and so on is quite awe inspiring. Um, Slavoj Žižek goes through the reasons for the Iraq war. Was it oil? Was it weapons of mass destruction, as they were saying? Was it the rescue of the Iraqi population from a tyrannical regime? And he says no to all of these. He says the Iraq war happened 
because he who perpetrated that war wanted to exactly say, this is what we can do. We went to war because we could. And that's Slavoj Žižek's analysis of the Iraq war. Okay, so if uh, we could take a, one or two questions, if you folks would come up and line up right here, you can ask the question right here, and I, and I am actually going to shut it down uh, in five or ten minutes. So, Greg, please. I'm Greg Stanton, and uh, I'm a professor of uh, genocide studies and prevention. Um, I just had several observations. First. Um, I think that your concept of sovereignty is actually not late modern at all. Uh, and in fact, I think you're right that Hannah Arendt has pointed out that the founding fathers of this country had a concept of sovereignty that was quite different than the European concept of sovereignty, namely that it emanates from the people and that the objective of government, in fact, is to establish a constitutional system for legitimation of the use of force. So law and force are not opposed, in fact. You need them both. Um, and I think the second thing that comes out of that and that I agree with you about is that not only was our country founded on uh, an imperial ideology, namely manifest destiny, in which we had this amazing belief that we had the right to conquer all of the Native American populations, commit genocide against them, and essentially, you know, drive them uh, into reservations. Um, and we still have a lot of this in our ideology of this country. Uh, you can still see it. And I mean, and you've given plenty of examples. The Iraq War is one. Um, but I would argue that perhaps following your, uh, your own um, logic of allowing people to determine, a, determine their own uh, sovereignty and allowing people to determine their own futures is exactly what this country should be about instead of building a U.S. Institute of Peace that is attempting to impose peace building and all kinds of other strategies by which we are forcing our model on them. And so I just wanted to make that comment because I actually agree with your outcome, even though I may not agree with all of the ways you, all the steps by which you got there. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Bridget Moix. I'm a new PhD student here. I have two questions. Um, one is a very uh, focused practical question. The, the second is a bit um, more theoretical. The first is about the ICC, um, which I um, appreciate your critique of in many ways, and your critique of interventionism and focus on prevention rather than violent intervention. Um, but the ICC has now decided that um, in 16 years or something, they will talk about the possibility of putting the crime of aggression onto its agenda. So it's essentially, would the ICC become a global governance mechanism about war? And the US has been quite opposed to this. Some small powers and developing countries have been advancing it. So I could try to guess what your opinion would be about that, but I would, wanted to ask directly what your thoughts are on that, um, that development. And the second question is about um, personal experience I'm involved in and some of what you were talking about in relation to looking for an alternative based on solidarity um, and the idea 
um, that you ended with that uh, we can no longer or, or we cannot try to shape other societies. And this morning I was on a telephone call with colleagues um, uh, from Kenya, from the, the UK, from New York and Washington, um, who are working together on some violence prevention programs in Kenya that are being led by Kenyans there. And we from the outside are trying to support. Um, it was a conversation among a small group of um, friends that cross political communities um, with a common goal of trying to prevent violence and the possibility of a debate about intervening in, in Kenya um, if there were violence to erupt around the elections. And what struck me is that um, by that solidarity, by that relationship that we're in with them, we are changing societies. We are changing theirs. We are being changed by, by them. And the space for relationship in your model, what, what it, my question is about the space for relationship across political communities that can shape new societies that hopefully are reducing violence. Is there space for that? I answer this first and okay. thank you very much for your insightful um, presentation and uh, my question is um, it's based on the two last um, scholars you presented that's um, uh, Michelle Foku and Dehana and this is how you defined the last concept that you gave us, which is the politics, that's what you favored. And you defined it as politics is the insertion of oneself to political arena and the idea that one has a voice. And so my question to you is, as a feminist scholar, what would you, um, paradox, paradoxical and imaginary, would you say to a woman, probably millions of women, who might not have opportunity to insert themselves in the politics, or rather male dominated politics, and who have no voice at all. Thank you. Vivian, very nice to see you here. If we were in London, I would say let's uh, retreat to a pub and continue, or to your flat and continue, until the wee hours in the morning. Uh, failing that, I'm Dennis Sandoli, one of the Escar professors. Um, comment and the question, perhaps the comment's also a question. Vivian, I think we might be in danger of painting peace building with a very broad brush. Uh, as you know, peace building, like conflict resolution, means many things to many different people. Um, for me, it means the elimination of structural violence. And by that definition, peace building in practice has failed uh, miserably uh, when articulated by government development agencies and by NGOs. It has failed. And in this regard, I'm in full agreement with Oliver Richman and his critique of the liberal peace, which I know you are as well. So I think peace building is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be very, very positive, but that's not the definition of peace building that's being practiced globally as we speak, which has failed because it hasn't eliminated structural violence which pays attention to the local, pays attention to grievances, uh, et cetera. The second question, if that first one is a question, um, is do you perhaps beg a question in your response to the first student, um, given that we should intervene earlier and should have done, we the international community should have done in Rwanda but failing that, we did not, and never really intervened even militarily in response to uh, Romeo Dallaire's begging Kofi Annan at UN headquarters back in New York to send uh, reinforcements to beef up his lightly uh, mandated, already present on the ground, uh, UN force to observe compliance with the uh, Arupa Accord entered into the previous summer. Given that failure, if people are being slaughtered by the hundreds, by the thousands, and we haven't done anything to prevent that development up to that point, I have the impression that your perspective might 
cause us to allow the slaughter to take place rather than do something of a horribly violent nature to stop it. And in stopping it, clearly we would be killing some of the people we were trying to save because of the proximity and dense population of Damascus or Kigali or uh, Warsaw. But don't you think at some point in time, we, the concerned international community, concerned with eliminating structural, cultural, and physical violence, have a responsibility to stop the killing of innocents once it takes place. Thank you. Hi, Vivian. Thank you very much for an enlightening lecture uh, and for it's going on now to three in the morning, something like that, right? Um, um, I'm Thomas Flores. I'm uh, an assistant professor here at SCAR. And I had one question about your conclusions. There, there are many steps before that, but you came back to praising, I think, good old-fashioned conflict resolution and traditional diplomacy. And it's that last part I'd like to ask about. Um, the idea of traditional diplomacy, as I understand it, um, and I'm thinking here of Henry Kissinger, right? And I'm thinking of Condoleezza Rice, right? Is, is barely one that could possibly be described as not intervening in the politics of other countries. It, perhaps if we think of traditional diplomacy as respecting some Westphalian concept of sovereignty. Uh, but, but, but still, the, this idea of traditional diplomacy as being some answer in, in, in reaction to peace building's more uh, messianic faith in sort of rebuilding society in a Western mold, right, it strikes me as sort of returning to another very problematic solution. And I'm just wondering how you're conceiving of traditional diplomacy, um, at good old fashioned traditional diplomacy, uh, in, and, and its place in the world today. Thank you. Guys, here we come. Um, th the nice thing about this, we'll, we'll let her make some final remarks. The, tomorrow at 12, we have a, a brown bag where we can continue this conversation, and it sounds to me like there's going to be a lively conversation tomorrow. So I hope that you'll join us then, too. So, yes, please. Now, despite the hour in, 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 the, in the early morning, I can actually go on forever, you know. <laughs> um, but as, as Dennis said, preferably over a pint of beer or, uh, you know, uh, at least a, a, a drink of some sort, a glass of wine or something, and dinner. <laughs> um, now, let me, let me try and remember what, what, what was asked. And I very much appreciate the first comments that, that uh, that, that were made. I mean, this whole lecture could have been centered on the notion of sovereignty and, uh, but specifically the articulations of political authority. And the question that exercises us, not just in relation to conflict, but also in relation to all sorts of regulatory regimes that are emerging globally. Where does political authority lie? Where is political authority located? If it's moving beyond, uh, beyond the modern secular sovereign state, then how do we think about legitimacy? I mean, these are, these are questions that, you know, that occupy us very much in, in within the European context. And in a sense, you know, the, the, the ingenious uh, design, you could say, of the, of the European context is that, um, you know, the, the, the founding fathers of the European Union were very much aware of, uh, in a sense, going too far with integration, right? And maybe this is, what, this is our dilemma in, in the present day. So, so the question of political community, you know, should be, uh, should be exercising all of us, not, not just in relation to conflict, but, uh, but in relation to, to, to other issues as well, the financial crisis, for example. Um, the second question was about the ICC, and where, where is the question? Yes, there you are was about the ICC and, and the crime of aggression. Um, in fact, this was, 
this is the crime that some people in the UK have argued should bring Blair, especially in front of a, in front of a criminal court. Because the Iraq war ha has been now interpreted as, ha as having been a war of aggression, especially with the um, non-presence of weapons of mass destruction and so on and so on. You know, we, we, know, we know that story. Um, I think your question was, would I, would I then be more favorably inclined towards, uh, to, yeah, to, towards this Habermasian dream of, you know, bringing about a, a cosmopolitan law? Um, interestingly, and to be generous to, to Habermas, um, he was actually against the Iraq war. He was for the Kosovan war, which he saw as being in the context of the responsibility to protect. But he was very much against the, um, the Iraq invasion because he saw that as a, as a crime of, as a war of aggression, and therefore a criminal act. Um, I think it would be a major achievement on the part of the International Criminal Court if they actually got this through. Now remember that despite Obama's statements about the International Criminal Court, that institution has not yet been recognized in this country. Uh, so, uh, you know, and the company that the US has amongst the non-recognizers of the International Com uh, Criminal Court is not actually good company. You know, by, by any measure, it's, it's not good company. And I think that the moment the International Criminal Court actually achieves that, then that would be, that would be a moment of celebration. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to the workings entirely to the workings of law. A society is based on, on the workings of law. Law is, is somehow a, a protector of societies. We would not want teenagers running amok in jeeps with Kalashnikovs. That's what happened in Sierra Leone. It's what happened in Liberia, and so on and so on. We rely on our institutions, and we value those institutions. I value our social democratic institutions in the UK and in the European Union. I underline social democracy, right? Uh, so I'm not against the idea of law as such. You know, when Pinochet was arrested actually in the UK, he lands at Heathrow Airport. There was an extradition uh, request that came from a Spanish prosecutor. Um, it came up on the radio, on, on BBC. Pinochet has been arrested at Heathrow. The day that that happened, I jumped out of, I was in bed Sunday morning, jumped out, started calling Chilean exiles in, in the UK, friends of mine that I'd, that I'd known as a, as a young activist in my, in my youth, you know, as trade unionists and so on. Um, and there was a genuine celebration of that. Because in that kind of arrest, exactly like Hannah Arendt describes it in the trial of Eichmann, with that kind of arrest, you enable the voice of the other to emerge. And you should have heard those Chilean exiles. And I haven't even mentioned the, you know, the Chilean population back home, right? So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to convey the idea that I would be against that kind of move. And in my opinion, in direct answer to your question, it, it, that indeed would be a moment to celebrate. Because what does it say? It reaffirms, what does it say? It reaffirms the boundaries and the limits of political community.
the very boundaries and limits that have been undermined in the recent past. That judgment would reaffirm those limits. So it's in that sense that I would, that I would celebrate it. Uh, now, there were other questions. Just remind me, I'm kind of fading, but just, just remind me what the other question was. Ah, yes, the slaughter of the, of the innocents. Um, and then there was the woman question from innocent. Where is he? There, <laughs> there he is. So the, the woman question and the slaughter of the innocents. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, a few, just a few questions. Now, if I, you've got to excuse me if I don't answer all the questions, but we do have a brown lunch tomorrow. And as, as you probably can tell, I'm kind of fantasizing about food at the moment. Uh, but <laughs> um, on the question of how, what do you do when there's a genocide going on, um, you know, the pacifists, of, uh, pacifists during the First World War and the Second World War were asked, what are you going to do, what will you do in relation to the Nazi uh, Holocaust, um, to the perpetration of the, of the, of the Holocaust? Um, and they were convinced by their, by their arguments that war only perpetuates many, multiple holocausts and, and the killing of millions of, 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 of civilians. Um, and yet I, I remain a reluctant intervener for the, for the reasons that I've, uh, that, that I've highlighted. Um, yes, there was uh, the Canadian gen general who did his utmost to, um, he did his bit when, when, the, when the genocide was taking place um, and calling for, for, for an intervention and yet it didn't, you know, it, it didn't come. But what kind of in intervention would we, have, would we have enacted? The bombing of the population that was being killed? I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I've, I would have to be convinced. Um, uh, but then I'm not, uh, at the same time, I would want to have a dialogue with, uh, with people from Rwanda, people like Innocent, people like uh, Patrick. What are the, you know, what are the choices? What are, what are, what are our options and that? Uh, in, in that context. So uh, I'm not convinced about the idea that we can bomb populations as an expression of our care for those populations. To kill even more in our self-righteousness, to kill even more. I'm just not convinced about that. So, sending in special forces? They have them. You have to pay. <laughs> Let me end with an answer to the to the uh, to the woman question at last, as, as the last, last as a la absolutely the last one. <laughs> uh, Innocent very rightly said that not that not everyone has that opportunity to exactly insert a presence in, in the public arena because women are oppressed in, in many societies and many women, by the way, are, continue to be oppressed in our societies. So let's not be too self-righteous about that either. Um, you saw in the Arab Spring that the women that we think are oppressed were also out there demonstrating and making their voice heard. So just because those women were covered and uh, were wearing traditional dress did not mean that they were uh, 
either amenable to manipulation or that they were doing this because they were forced to. Rather, they see themselves and continue to see themselves as, as political beings, as beings that have something to say. So uh, while I recognize that there is inequality of access to the public sphere, I think a politics of solidarity exactly enables that opening out of spaces, of a multiplicity of spaces that we might then call public spaces, that we might then constitute as indeed public spaces. So that would be my answer to your, to your question. Thank you. All right, bravo. <laughs> this is, trust me, this is not the last word. Join us at noon tomorrow. Um, place to be announced, I can't, I don't have it in front of me. Five, five, five. Right, 555 five, five in Truland, and we will start round two of this. So thank you, Vivian, so much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.